Hello and welcome everybody to this Animation Nodes tutorial. Today it's going to be a little bit different because we're covering a really fun topic. Math. Wait, hold on. Where are you going? No, 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 come back. I swear it's cool. Joking aside, one of the most common questions I get asked about Animation Nodes is I'll get sent a link and they'll be like, how do I recreate this specific effect in Animation Nodes? And while I'm always happy to help, you know, I usually go down in the comments and walk people through it. One of the main reasons I do a series like this is to teach you the tools to do it yourself. And that's something I was thinking about that I haven't really covered. I've covered a lot of Animation Nodes tools and how Animation Nodes works, but Animation Nodes relies on a lot of other things, a lot of more abstract things. And that's the things I haven't covered, things like fundamental problem solving in mathematics. So that's kind of what I want to get into in this video. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you who are watching this series are artists and animators, and that makes me kind of the odd one out. Because as a lot of you know, um, my background's mainly in programming and mathematics. Now, it's important to note that I didn't really like math that much in school. Um, it wasn't until I learned that I could actually make cool things out of it in motion graphics that it actually started to become something I wanted to learn more about. So in this video, I'm going to be going over a general problem solving technique as well as the basic mathematic tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and then in the next few videos, I'm going to kind of walk you through some examples and kind of give you an example of like how I think and how I solve the problems. And hopefully that'll be really helpful. Now, difficulty warning. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to be covering should sound pretty familiar to anyone who is in or has graduated high school. However, for my younger viewers, which I know there's a few, um, don't be afraid and don't turn away quite yet because there's still a lot you can learn, especially if you made it this far into the series. At the very least, you will be able to kind of just glaze over the videos, um, get a little bit here and there, and when you actually encounter these things in school, you'll understand the cool ways that these tools can be used. I generally approach a problem in three basic steps. One, get a basic idea of what kind of result I want to achieve. Remember, this is motion graphics, not nuclear physics. If we want to scale back or accidentally stumble upon something that is a lot more interesting, we can always adjust this step later. Two, figure out what data we already have at our disposal. This is just a brainstorm of what resources we will have at the moment we need to solve the problem. This can be things like object position, rotation, and any other data that we have available that might help us figure out a solution. Finally, three, determine what tools we can use in order to use the data from step two to get to our result in step one. So now over to the math side. While the exact math from project to project is going to vary wildly, there are some common tools that are going to come up time and time again as you script visuals. And so today I'm going to walk through some of the basic tools and give you some examples of the basic use cases for them, but I want to really stress that this is by far from the only use cases of these tools. And as you start to play with them, as, as you start to get more familiar with them, you're going to come up with your own ways and your own kind of tips and tricks on like where to use these things. While it might sound obvious to some, one of the first things that we will need to understand is how basic math like addition and subtraction can be used. Addition and subtraction can be thought of as a constant offset to a value, whatever that value may be. For example, if we are dealing with a position, then adding 5 to an object's original position will always offset it by 5, with the opposite being true for subtraction. When dealing with a group of objects like we usually are in animation nodes, changing the amount that we are adding and subtracting will result in making even changes across the whole group. Multiplication and division can similarly be thought of as an offset, but one that changes or scales based on the value that is used. If we multiply the x-coordinate of a group of objects by 3 in order to get the y-coordinate, then the amount that it's offset is going to change based on what the x-coordinate is, giving us a stair-step effect. When combined with an addition, we can see the difference in the applications. Multiplying changes the individual stair height, while addition changes raise and lower the floor of the whole staircase. Another important thing to note is that addition is switchable with subtraction, and multiplication is switchable with division. Adding a negative value is the same as subtracting, just like subtracting a negative value is the same as adding. Multiplying by a fractional value, such as 0.25, is the same as dividing by 4, and dividing by a fractional value like 0.5 is the same as multiplying by 2. TLDW, addition and subtraction is an offset while multiplication and division will scale a value. Now, I know, I know, a lot of you are rolling your eyes at how basic some of that math was, but I can't stress enough how important uh, just a solid understanding of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division is. Um, it's literally going to be in every project you do, and if you don't understand it, it's going to severely limit what you can do with animation nodes. But now that I've got that out of the way, we can get to the more advanced tools in our toolbox. Some of the tools we are going to cover are floor and ceiling functions, modulo, algebraic functions, as well as sine, cosine, and basic trig. 
The floor and ceiling functions are pretty simple. They are basically rounding without the rounding. Floor will drop a decimal number to the nearest whole number, while ceiling will raise it to the nearest whole number. These functions are good for breaking up a constantly changing number into segments, sort of like how a clock's constantly spinning motor gets split into individual seconds. The modulo function works kind of like division, except it returns only the remainder or the overflow of the division. Again, using the clock analogy, we can think of a clock as being time modulo 12. If we were at noon on a clock and were to go forward 14 hours, we would land on 2. Also, lower numbers are unaffected, so 7 modulo 12 is still 7, while 31 modulo 12 is also 7. Next, an understanding of algebra and functions are really important because it not only teaches us how we can manipulate inputs and outputs, but also how we can rewrite formulas to get what we want out of them. The classic formula for getting the y position based on an x input is y equals mx plus b. However, if we wanted to instead get the slope, we would need to rewrite this as m equals y minus b over x in order for the computer to be able to calculate it. Now, this is kind of an arbitrary example, but being able to do this type of rearranging will help in the third step of our problem solving, as oftentimes it'll be necessary in order to get the output we need. Finally, we have the most difficult topics, sine, cosine, and trigonometry. There's no possible way to even begin to scratch the surface of this one, but at the very least, I can gloss over some of the important bits. Sine and cosine are functions used to calculate angles and create circles. Cosine is for calculating the x value, and sine is for calculating the y value. They are also really handy for generating smooth oscillations and wave shapes. Trigonometry in general is really important in solving problems that have to do with angles, and simply knowing how to find missing angles using SOHCAHTOA or converting between degrees and radians is all knowledge that won't go to waste in creating dynamic motion graphics. Now, I know this video is going to be kind of a black sheep in the series, but I'm hoping this video, as well as the next few where I walk you through my problem solving, is going to encourage some of you to kind of experiment more on your own. That about wraps up this video. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to help me support this channel and make more videos like this one, you know what to do. Support me at my Patreon page at the end of this video or in the link in the description down below. And as always, I will see you next time.